Uh, by the way, okay, so I'm a neurologist. I do other things, but um, this is one of my clinical research interests. Um, do we like pot or art? <laughs> I like pot. Oh, okay. oh, but then you sound like an occupational therapist. I know, I do. Art. There's it's just a... Okay, call us pot. It's a lower Scrabble score as well. <laughs> anyway, I call it pot. Just always have. Yes. Because, yes. you know. We kind of just dropped it. Uh, I just don't know. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I was asked to, I was around in 20, was it 15 in Sydney? 13. 13. 13. 13 in Sydney. Yeah. Wow. July. Oh, blue. Um, so I'm supposed to be giving all the latest updates since 2013. Um, which will take about five minutes. <laughs> uh, there is some new stuff. Oh, hang on. So if you're going to Google things, by the way, I haven't put this up, but um, uh, don't go to, like, blogs are fine. They're great for support. It's really awesome that you can support each other in a blog. But just be aware that um, as a, you can write this down, it's not here, PubMed is all the publications from 1966 in peer-reviewed journals. Um, so generally, if it's published in PubMed, you can sort of believe it, <coughs> although people will question that. Um, depends on the quality of the research. Um, so yeah, uh, I did a movement disorders fellowship some years ago with some really good people who have now left. Um, some of them are still dabbling in research, but others have retired. But um, it was good quality research. Uh, um, just starting with a really simple um, premise that medications, so orthopedic tremor have been around since 1984. Uh, the main medication that had been used until that time was clonazepam, which is arguably just anxiolytic or calming. Mm -hmm. um, so it reduces the uh, phobia of falling, presumably. No one's actually ever done a clonazepam study to see whether it reduces tremor or, or body sway. Um, but, you know, we, I use it a lot for a variety of tremors and I think it's mainly just it damps down the... the any tremor will worsen when you're stressed. So clonazepam will just take the edge off that bit, which can be very sedating. Um, but anyway, it's still useful. Adult, you know, um, people with OT are often on a cocktail of different things. A little bit of this and that, and I use a little bit of that, clonazepam. Um, okay, so... Uh, did a bit of research and then fast forward, as Sue said, I now work at a, I love my, the title of my, I don't, everyone asks me, so I had some people over, Peter Silberman was over last week yeah. doing a case with us. Yeah. And everyone wants to know, well, oh, it's called Hollywood, no one knows. <laughs> but I know, I love that I work in Hollywood. Um, uh, I don't, it's not just me, I have a, like there's a neuropsychiatrist, so if I, you know, have a patient with OT or anything, where there's a significant component of anxiety ruining their quality of life, you must involve another doctor. Uh, and the guy in the middle is a neurosurgeon. Um, I would not do DBS. No one's, just no one's asked me. <laughs> it's a quality of life thing. Is your first, first customer? No. <laughs> Chef, uh, where are you from? Adelaide. Yeah, get someone there to do it. Um, yeah, if your quality of life is significantly Im impacted, you should consider surgery. And I'll, I'll go over the surgical data. There is a little bit more data than 2013. Um, I stopped doing research because I wasn't supported by institutes. It's just too hard. Um, you can't do research solo, but I've just discovered that there is a study coordinator at my hospital. Just discovered it this year. So we get, we're doing a small uh, industry-funded tremor trial for some new drug for essential tremor, for example. Uh, and immediately, you know, people will want to try. If, if it comes out, they'll try for other tremor syndromes. That's what happens. Every new anti-epileptic drug just try it on, on a tremor, just yeah. give it a go. Um, okay, so the talk out outline, I have to include all the preamble because some of you might not have heard the original talk about what we understand of OT. Um, <coughs> Do I have a pointer? I'll shoot this. Okay. Right, doesn't matter. Um, and broadly speaking, there's lots and lots of descriptions because uh, researchers find it fascinating and just you can just do all these different studies that may or may not eventually help people, but some of them have. Um, and then there's research looking at different new therapies. So that's good. Nothing worse than getting a lot of descriptive papers, just you know, detailing your disease, um, and then it goes nowhere. So um, oh, there's a group in Munich, I 
go visit them. They've got some good stuff. Um, so it is a weird condition. Um, you couldn't design a more annoying disease. It's invisible. You sort of get up and you can't understand why you're unsteady. And um, the descriptions I've got vary from, you know, my legs are shaky, which is pretty obvious. To um, um, I feel panicky. I'm going to fall over, which, which is not specific. And then you have to disentangle the phobia of walking and standing and social anxiety from the actual physiology. Um, and then you just do the EMG test, electromyography. I've got a little portable one. Yeah. Show you later. Um, but yeah, it only happens when you stand and it worsens the longer you stand. Um, and it, uh, the symptoms improve or disappear, not in everyone. Uh, apparently, if you walk up steps, does anyone have difficulty? difficulty? So of the people in the room with OT, how many people here, put your hand up, would, would you say your symptoms disappear when you walk? Disappear, okay. What about when you're standing on one leg? Like walking up, no, walking upstairs, sorry. Walking upstairs, is that hard? Downstairs. 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 Okay, but for the people who say they, this symptoms disappear when they walk, keep your hands up. So if you don't have trouble walking downstairs, keep your hand up. So stairs seem to be a problem. Um, it's because you're spending more time on the standing foot. There's a really good study that <coughs> outlined that. Yeah, so lawn bowls, I would imagine. Um, got a lot of patients who have to give up lawn bowls. Um, yeah, and it's really unimpressive to see. It's very it's this invisible disease. Uh, and you can look at all sorts of disability scales. It's as disabling in some cases as Parkinson's. People use wheelchairs. And, um, so, yeah, I'm a DBS uh, fan, a fan of DBS. I think more people should consider it, but we'll get to that. Um, I understand why they don't. Um, all right, yeah, so non-specific disequilibrium is one of my favourite non -fa uh, it's a term you use when you're just not sure why someone's dizzy or unsteady. <laughs> Psychogenic is flat out. Um, well, you can be, you can have like a, a, an anxiety disorder around dizziness, but some people get phobic of busy environments and other things. And this can be, you know, co-diagnosed with OT. So it doesn't have to be separate. Uh, and yes, it's really good to see that there's a, um, someone talking about psychological approaches to managing tremor. Um, this is just one of the papers from a... These guys are pretty well known. Uh, movement disorder specialist. 40 patients from France. Um, so French get OT as well. Uh, I don't know what grounded <laughs> theory approach is. Sue's cleverer than me. She should know all this stuff. Fear of falling was identified as the main predictor. So most people don't fall. But if you spend all your life worrying about falling, that's not fun. So it's called triple F syndrome. Actually, when someone falls and then they have a fear of further falling, that's triple F syndrome. I don't know what you call it in, in pot. Never fall in triple F. I mean, some people do fall because yeah. you get tired. Yeah, but in general, it's a fear of falling rather than fa falling. I've not seen a lot of, you know, I've got more Parkinson's patients or cerebellar ataxia patients with fractured wrists and hips than OT patients. Um, so yeah, health related quality of life, bad. Uh, this is the one and only video. So this is a lady who was about to stand up. This is about 15 years old, this video, but um, this is a nice machine. It's nice and loud. You'll see the, <coughs> um, uh, the patient stand up and then uh, eventually sit down and then you'll see the EMG bursts on the screen. Um, and then you'll see the EMG bursts of a normal, non-OT patient's legs. If I can just play. Yeah. 
So when you activate them up to normal, you just get that envelope. Whereas the MOT, you get the. So that each each of those. Like squiggly line going up and down, that's the electrical activity uh, of what you call it, the pen of the. Because normally with a, a normal muscle activator, you just get a, a wave. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's relatively easy to diagnose. Um, you know, once someone wants to sort of it, that's the problem with <laughs> thinking of it in the first place. Um, and you get people turning up in balance with each. Um, so, secondary orthostatic tremor, this is someone with Parkinson's. Um, sec I've still yet to find a, a cause of OT. You know, we scan everyone from head to toe, do all sorts of blood tests. Um, and rarely it's reported with, you know, MS or this, that and the other, but still haven't found anyone with structural cause. Um, but this is, a, this is an orthostatic tremor due to Parkinson's disease. But you can see it's wildly different from the previous lady. I didn't measure a tremor in his legs on and off, but obviously it's better. <coughs> so he's still not perfect because his legs are still shaking when he's walking, but um, they're shaking less. Uh, and other than his tremor, he's pretty good. That was 10 years ago, though. So what's the origin of this strange tremor that, you know, it, act it actually, it's not just activated by standing up. You know, you think it's some verticality detector, but if you push on uh, an object, you'll get tremor in the hands in some cases, or if you lie down and push on someone's leg, you can measure the tremor. So there's other different theories of what generates it, but. Um, from top to bottom in the nervous system, everything's been implicated. Um, uh, of the animal kingdom, Great Danes seem to get it, but that doesn't really help us. Um, so <laughs> you, can, you can YouTube videos of like dogs just trying to settle, and they have an orthopedic tremor. Um, and bulldogs have head tremor. I've got French bulldogs, so I know about bulldogs. <laughs> get your bulldog stressed, and it gets this. 10 hertz head tremor, which has also been published in the Journal of Movement Disorders. I love it. <laughs> this has not been published um, in a human journal. Um, yeah, so um, just to be vague, it originates somewhere in the brain or spinal cord. <laughs> somewhere. I, know, I shouldn't make fun of it, but like everyone's trying to thin it down. It's not, there's no such thing as one, the brain is a network, so. People should just give up looking for the holy grail of one spot. Mm. Um, and who was saying this about sim Sue was saying something about different symptom sets, and not everyone with OT is the same because it's not a disease; it's a syndrome. So it's, there's different forms of it, but uh, we're just describing it. We don't have um, pretty pictures in everyone just so exactly what's going on. And the fact that one person will respond to gabapentin or not. Um, or any drug, or deep brain stimulation of the same target. It just tells you this and it can't be the same. It's a network that goes wrong. There's probably different, you know, hot spots within that network in different patients. Uh, we know this from essential tremor. That's the commonest cause of tremor in humans. Um, totally different. It starts off in the hands, although some patients with OT can have a bit of hand tremor or more than a bit. Um, yeah, ET is a syndrome as well, and they can't quite pin down where in the brain that's coming from or which gene. 
Um, so just pull back and try and understand it from what's going on with postural control and where does that feed in. So obviously we don't think vision's the problem with OT because uh, eyesight's normal. Um, although if you close your eyes you can get worse tremor and body sway. It's one of the ways we um, measure it. Uh, the vestibular organ, the inner ear, uh, again, that's not implicated, but it doesn't help if you, get that, you know, go off and get a bout of vertigo or have inner ear problems, many ears or something like that. Um, so if you do have any of this stuff, if you have poor vision, if you have cataracts, get them fixed. Um, don't ignore vertigo because it's an additional cause of the fear of falling. Um, the legs themselves, obviously, they're innocent. They just wobble. <laughs> um, but then someone's gone and tried to blame the legs. So. In the leg muscle, so there's a really cool little device within the muscle called a muscle spindle um, and it's got this tight little coil of, it's like a little tension detector um, and that's uh, been implicated in part because if you push on something, um, the muscle spindle feeds back muscle tension and that sets up this feedback loop. This is the feedback loop for a reflex, you know, the old knee jerk, for example. So one of the theories is that, you know, the longer you stand, the muscle spindle set up this resonant feedback, feedback loop um, and then just drives this tremor. <coughs> but I don't think the spindles are, I think they're innocent. And you don't know what causes the unsteadiness. Victor Fung's study is coming up that'll highlight that. Okay, so um, there's no gold standard for measuring it. Um, there's the subjective things, the quality of life and all that sort of stuff and uh, falls. Uh, anxiety scales and balance confidence scales, all those things exist. You can measure the body sway, the wobble. Uh, hopefully the force platform will work. I didn't like the trip over trying to set it up last night, um, but we were be able to fix it. So that's um, a computerized balance assessment, test body sway and balance control. Um, you can measure the tremor, but just it's a problem because this is, you saw before that lady that was her rocking back and forth, so depending on how much weight you bear on which muscle and um, uh, whether you're doing this or not, um, the, you, know, you can't measure tremor exactly, it's sampling bias. Um, so the force platform is nice because I think it just captures all the forces in XYZ plane um, and then you measure it with different stats, this is the, the uh, ellipse around most of the data. So you leave out, this is just someone having a bit of a wobble, you don't want to include all that, um, but you get a number. So this is someone um, where their sway area was 10 centimeters and after treatment with, in this case, gabapentin, it was like 30%. Um, and then this noisy looking graph here, if you blow it up, um, you, this is the, freq the, the frequency on the bottom. Um, and the, the, the size of the tremor or power. So, uh, yeah, you can measure this just all off the force platform. Um, otherwise, you have to stick on electrodes and trying to wire someone up with electrodes, which we did, you know, just reduces your balance confidence even further. You're wired up to all this stuff. Um, uh, but there are people who have wireless things, so it's nice. Uh, so you saw this already. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, <coughs> But this is a control um, person. So yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite a lot more sway. And this is just when you're just standing with eyes open. Um, so you can imagine if, and this is only for, uh, I think it's only for, I forget if it's 20 or 60 seconds, but just imagine yourself, uh, if you have the condition, when you're in the second minute or the third minute where this is building up and the feeling of unsteadiness is ramping up. So this is what, um, Victor Fung about 20 years ago did this study that just confused everyone. Like, uh, so the patients were all wired up. They were on a force plat. They were measuring body sway, they were measuring the electrical activity in a number of muscles. Um, so good on patients for actually doing all this. And in addition, they had this little uh, device that they were holding that they racked up the start, mild, moderate, severe. So this is their, their little. Un their, their degree of unsteadiness and they tried to look at the correlation between how unsteady you feel the longer you stand let's just say that's a minute or longer uh, and you see the tremor starts low and gradually ramps up 
Um, and that's consistent with what you see in some people. If there is a visible tremor, it's really quite bad by the end of the stand and the trunk's involved. But the wobble, the wobble doesn't change. So no one knows what that means. So there is something that is generating unsteadiness that appears not to be, you know, ramping up body. It's not like it's all over the place here. That's an artifact. Um, but tremor is increasing. So um, again, people wandered off and made all sorts of theories as to what it all meant. But um, I was mainly focused on measuring things and seeing what gets better when you treat people. So um, uh, along with the static stand, you can do these fun tests where this is a bird's eye view of someone standing like this and having to lean this way and that way. It's not a very... I remember doing that. Yeah, it's not a very... It's not a practical day-to-day -day thing to do, um, but it does test your limits of stability. So the worst direction is backwards, so, um, and it, it doesn't test postural responses, which is another important thing to test. But there's other gadgets which will test that. This is all. It's is the pro this protocol was designed to just test people within the shortest amount of time possible with the least amount of gadgetry. Um, that's why we came up with this way of doing it. So you get all these measures of, will they wobble this way and did they overshoot the target? Um, and then you test drugs. So um, clonazepam we mentioned, um, all the problems of it. Uh, you can also lose benefit over time. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, they're mainly dopaminergic medications, which we don't really understand because people uh, do not go on and develop Parkinson's disease, you know, you know it's, not, it's not the start of Parkinson's disease. I've had one patient that after 20 years developed Parkinson's disease that she was also in her 80s. So it's just a common thing to happen. You can get, two, you can get a rare disease and a common disease. Um, there were some case reports of gabapentin being useful. don't know, uh, I can't remember how that came about, but, uh, but I'm sure it was the usual. There's a new antileptic drug that's tried on tremor, so that was good. Because uh, it seems to have been... Uh, a useful drug in some people, so we did this double-blind trial. So the, the problem with trials and getting them published is that you have to do a placebo arm. Um, but of course we had people who were on it and you take them off it. It's not very blinded um, when it's working. I mean there were two, two uh, I think there were six patients, two of them were treatment failures, so um, that's why you do it. But uh, uh, it's a hard, hard thing to do. You need drug company support for this one. I was hand filling all the little capsules myself and um, just can't do that anymore. Um, anyway, that was good because we got it published in a proper journal, Movement Disorders. Um, and lots of pictures, but basically the bottom line is this is baseline and this is improvement. Um, so there is some improvement in the sway area and the tremor and everything else um, to an extent, but there's still not normalized. Um, so in this quality of life scale, it's uh, adapted from a Parkinson's one. Zero is like perfect health. And there are questions like, getting around, how did you go getting around the house or doing the dishes? Um, and there's some screening questions in there for mood and stuff. So, so the blue line is actually on treatment. So even with treatment, there's issues. But um, not to say that gabapentins are a cure or anything, but it's, it's useful, but people still have, there's more to do in terms of non-drug approaches. So again, this is ages ago, uh, gabapentin, I still use gabapentin and I switch back and forth, uh, depending on people's tolerance and response and add in things. Um, I've never used gabapentin and pregabalin because they kind of wouldn't make sense. Um, they act on the same receptor. So this is just, a tiny, tiny study of comparing Lyrica versus Gabapentin, and I could show you slides that go the other way, where patients who just can't tolerate Lyrica and go back onto Gabapentin, or uh, not back on. Um, in general, Lyrica has more side effects than, than Gabapentin. So there's just one patient who was a winner. Um, she was very happy that Lyrica arrived, because um, she was on a big dose of Gabapentin, you know, 2,000 to 300 milligrams is a big dose. Um, 900 a day is just a starting dose. 
Uh, but yeah, look, so this is with her swaying all around the place um, and with her eyes open. So this is gabapentin, this is Lyrica. Um, this is with her eyes closed, it's same data. Um, and for some reason we had a researcher who was getting people to do this distracting cognitive task. Um, and I was looking at it yesterday thinking, this is, it's actually the Stroop test. But you could do the same thing, getting people to stand there and count backwards by sevens from 100, serial sevens. Um, if you have Parkinson's disease and you do this kind of cognitive task, you kind of sway more. And if the uh, Parkinson's patient is walking, they, they shuffle and freeze more. But weirdly, like, I know there's only one person. Um, if you distract someone with OT who's just standing there, their sway is less. So I don't know if it's, but that's the opposite of what people say. Like I can't stand there and so having a conversation, which is arguably a distraction. Does anyone think that if they can, they can distract themselves, they can balance better? Yeah. Mind over tremor. Anyway, so I don't think that's, I don't think that was real. But it's something. It's just data. Uh, it's interesting. I don't have an, ex an explanation. Um, okay, and oh, sorry, that was the tremor power. Tremor, tremor was less, so, um, but also this way. That's the sway data. So there you go. Another unanswered question, um, but I like this. Pink is pregabalin. P pink, green for gabapentin. Um, so yeah, the squiggly lines that are pink showed that the tremor burst improved, so we were all pretty stoked with this. Went over to Kyoto on a junket, ate lots of amazing food, presented a poster, and I thought, oh, I'll just go publish it. Uh, so I wrote it up, um, take all the time and effort, and they didn't like it, so um, there's still nothing, you can still find nothing on yep. pregabalin if you PubMed it, Dr. Google it. And then I went to Pfizer and said, let's do a study, and I didn't like it either. Because they make, because uh, I initially said, let's compare gabapentin with pregabalin, and they didn't want their new drug compared with their old drug. Oh, oh I reckon. Yeah. That's what I reckon. And then I rewrote the protocol to say, well, we'll just leave that out, and then um, everyone lost interest. Not me, like drug companies, because it is a, what's the, they just think, what's the, what's the market for a rare condition? So it sucks. So that's still waiting to happen, and people keep saying you should put it in this journal. You know, there's, um, there's these sort of online-only journals, with low impact, but at least it's on PubMed. Um, so if someone wants to help me submit an article, feel free. It's just still sitting there. Okay, now new stuff, new stuff, um, generally involves new techniques of imaging the brain, um, and I don't want you to get scared by any of this data because some of it's and just take it with a grain of salt. So there's one that I came across with cognitive changes in OT and uh, I didn't put it up because I read it and decided it, it was describing cognitive changes that are more likely to be due to the psychological burden of OT rather than a um, degenerative problem of thinking, which is what I think they're implying. And they did a depression scale, but just one. So um, if you come across that, just ignore it. Like when we're doing proper... Nope, I'm talking about whether someone with OT has thinking problems because this is some of the literature that I... So since 2013 there was one paper that said that but I think it's more likely to be the anxiety associated with falling and walking which impacts on cognition because I've seen people with, say, migraine and severe anxiety and they can't think. Mm. So that type of associated cognitive impact. Um, anyway, this is a good study. Um, so uh, it's sort of narrowing down the network for OT. So there's the leg area of the motor cortex um, and the supplementary motor area which is to do with movement planning um, and then there's the cerebellum which is the back of the brain, the hind brain to do with um, balance and postural control. Uh, so this has been reported before but this is just a nice study if you're going to point at something because um, it involves the you know, postural adjustments that you're constantly having to make. Um, the changes are reduced in some respects. So the, this is a way that measures, so it's not brain atrophy. Your brains are normal. If you look at it, it's a, you know, on a normal scan, no one reported as atrophied, but there's this 
statistical method looking at how gray a little part of the brain is and then they can get volumes and uh, um, so you can see changes in gray matter volume using this method in normal controls if you study a lot or train in something um, so they're quite sensitive uh, and in OT patients the lateral part of the cerebellum has reduced gray matter uh, and they think to compensate for it the middle part has increased so these are the little blobs here blue blobs um, uh, and also um, this is increased activity in the postural control area of the leg and then they went on to say that lo and behold it's a disease of the cerebellum um, fair enough um, and in the middle somewhere here, we can see it is the thalamus, where everyone's been putting their electrodes. And in case you're wondering why they don't put it in the cerebellum, um, it's because it doesn't work. It's too big a target. Turns out the thalamus is like the little junction box where everything funnels in. So we like putting electrodes there. It can just short circuit a number of tremors. Doesn't matter what the network is, it seems to work. Um, they also tried stimulating using a big magnetic coil. Has anyone heard of transcranial magnetic stimulation? Mm. So I did some studies on it. It's not very tolerable because you've got to get through. Well, the scalp here is easy because you can just click away here and, and the hand twitches and you can do measures of that. But the cerebellum is behind all your neck muscles. So we used to sit there with this huge big, called a cone coil on the back of your head. And every time you'd activate it, your neck would just go click. Like. Mm. So you give people a whiplash. Mm. Anyway, so I'm good on these patients for putting up with it. One patient out of however many, the handful, said that they, they felt less unsteady, but most people didn't. So um, there are placebo effects, obviously. Uh, all right, this is interesting. I like this. This is, so what I should, didn't mention that I don't, you know, I've dusted off the platform, false platform to bring it here. Um, I don't use it in regular day-to-day -day, um, assessment. I just get people to stand with their if they can, with their feet together, eyes closed, because that's the most sensitive thing. And if it's, you know, 15 to 20 seconds, that's terrible. Try and get it up to 30 or more. Um, if they're looking to stand with their feet together, eyes open for a minute, that's pretty good. Um, well, it's not great, but um, it's better than, you know, 10 seconds. Uh, and then I get people to, work. as part of the assessment of the cerebellum, you do this sort of thing, finger nose test. Um, and you don't see any abnormalities in OT patients. You might see a bit of tiny bit of tremor, but not ataxia, which is overshooting and all this sort of stuff. But you do see that when you do the force platform stuff, they overshoot. Um, and you, you know, your neurologist will get you to do this one. <laughs> so I do it slow, and I ask people if you go faster, do you go better? Try this after a drink. So <laughs> everyone looks down. The first thing I say is don't look down, look straight ahead because then you've got more vision. And then I ask them to try and walk faster and I ask them whether walking faster is easier. Has anyone ever done that? We can do it in the break. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to. And feedback. So anyway, this is from the 90s, from this... Uh, legendary guy, you know, movement disorder specialist. Um, um, by the way, this is, only, this is the only case series where they found a lot of people that responded to L-DOPA. Um, and then they are POMs. They were just POMs with POTS responded to L-DOPA. Because I've never had any, any joy with L-DOPA. Tried it a lot. Anyone here swear by levodopa for their OT? No? Well, these, one, these patients must have had some kind of different physiology. Anyway, I always ask people about this. Um, do you think you can walk faster, better than slower? So they're always rushing around. <laughs> so I don't think that's reported enough. No one ever, no, I don't think anyone's ever complained to me of that. I have to walk quicker. No. Not everyone. Oh no, yeah, you can't. Just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, so like when you're leaving like a concert or something and you're yeah. doing yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, 
and then, so I wanted to do a study of like hooking up people to wireless monitors and then got some money from the Nord people and then the institute that I was with just, I couldn't get them to help out. So I gave the money back. But anyway, someone, someone did the study. It's really good. Um, so they got, actually this is on a treadmill. So again, it's not real life. But it's a treadmill, oh, no. treadmill no. with uh, um, oh. force detecting technology and you can measure the tremor and things. So, and what do you know, when you stand, so when you're walking, and that's a stance phase and it's a swing phase, so on the stance phase you get 16 hertz tremor. And it's not not there when you're swinging, but it's way less. And this is, the red blob is just showing that it's um, coherent or the frequency is very tightly knit between muscles. Um, and weirdly, I don't know, again, this is just a, I did see this with some, so some people with treatments, the frequency changes a bit. It just must be something to do with the, um, if you slow firing of a neuron, it'll obviously just change the frequency. But anyway, walking, for what it's worth, changes the frequency a bit. That doesn't tell us much more about the cause of it, though. Um, and they did see people where the base of, I'm exaggerating, the base of your support is obviously nice if you like this. Um, uh, and the regularity of steps was, was reduced. This is uh, vaguely similar to people with a cerebellar ataxia. Uh, but again, I said there's, there's, no, there's no hard cerebellar signs in primary or static tremor. So anyway, that's why you should walk fast. And do your physio to build your muscles up so you can walk faster. Um, what's this one about? Oh, it's the same guys. So yeah, these people in Munich. I go to Munich a bit. Might drop in and see what's going on. Um, Wuh. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce it. And who? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this one? Schnip. 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 <laughs> and all together we have Wuh, Schlick, Mühlt, and Schnip. <laughs> and, and they think that the. Um, this is <laughs> the knights who say ni. <laughs> so this is 2018. This is hot off the press. Um, there's going to be more from these people. I won't say guys. That would be sexist. Uh, and they're doing all the stuff that I like. Like they're doing actually posturography. Whereas a lot of the deep brain stimulators are just saying, there you go. Um, Peter does, has a balance, balance lab. I'm not sure if you've been through it. Um, okay. So they got this device. Um, I'll show you a picture in a second. Anyway, this is a study where uh, if you get a little massager device, uh, a tendon vibrator, uh, and you vibrate a tendon, in this case the Achilles, um, it reduced the tremor. So this is the orthostatic tremor burst. The black is without stim. Did I have a useful... No, oh, hang on. Oh yeah. Let's read my own slide. So grey is with stim on. So uh, this is a frequency plot. So uh, at the main frequencies, you know, black is without stim, and this is with. So this is, seems to be useful, and this is a bit, you know, the body sway with the tendon vibrator. I tried to find a picture of tendon vibrator on Google Images. You can imagine what kept coming up. <laughs> so this, uh, I just, <laughs> and I t went to the paper, I've got all the papers, if you want the, this talk and all the refer references are on the thumb drive if you want. And I even typed in the manufacturer and I still kept getting sex toys. <laughs> so this would appear, imagine something like this, just miniaturized, just pop it on a couple of the tendons, maybe mm -hmm. the, the patella and your Achilles and off you go. And if it damps down this stance phase, um, tremor, then your walking should be better. You should be able to walk slow. So that's a bottom-up approach. I like that. Um, and look forward to hearing more from... Uh, all right, drugs. S there's no new drugs except for this one, unless anyone tells me. And Sue came in going parampanel. So that was from the group. I hadn't heard about it because, you know, I'm trying to um, keep, keep in touch with 
Who's your new? True. Um, Dob Min. I know, I probably know them. Ravindran, you've had contact with him, Dr. Ravindran. Have I? Yes. Yeah, I was going, okay, it's pr Parampanol. I know nothing about it. I know I tell people I don't, you know, don't know anything about it, but I will look it up and see the safety mm -hmm. profile and then, um, and then just discuss whether people want to start it or not. Um, yeah, I'll talk, I want to find out at the end. Um, yes, I'll talk to Peter. Peter rang me. He said, you're liking parampanol. So yeah, we'll have a discussion about drugs at the end. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, full symptomatic relief. Uh, I don't know for how long though. And this is, I don't know these people. Um, that doesn't matter though. Uh, yeah, look at all these drugs. That must be the European gabapentin. But that's a small dose. Um, so they're on all this stuff. I would just just give one of these a good go and then get rid of it and then if someone if a drug has a 30% benefit for example you'd go lovely we'll put that to the side and see whether something can give you 80% and then you know add them back in that's the way I do it but I would never have someone on I don't have anyone on more than two things so I don't understand combining gabapentin and pregabalin you just divide the dose by 5 so that or times up by f is a, there's a conversion rate and then you just switch um, and so this person got side effects of dizziness and then halved the dose but still worked and the EMG improved. So there you go. Alright, so um, no new drugs unless anyone's going to tell. Let's save the questions till the end or comments till the end. Um, deep brain stimulation. There is at least one person here with DBS for OT. Who else? Not for OT. Okay. And that works. Mm. Perfect. Six years. Yep. PPM. Yeah, mm. Absolutely. You also have a tremor. Tell me about it later. Mm. So, um, for primary orthostatic tremor, there's been like maybe 20, 25 patients reported. Um, this is from Westmead, where they've done three or four with different targets. And how are we going for time? Oh, <laughs> he's probably out for a drink. You can't have any alcohol yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> double figures. It's a double. Um, okay, so this is so this is serious stuff. You've gone and put wires in your brain. You want it to work. Exactly. Um, but then this is a little discussion about whether spinal cord stimulators are useful. I don't know if anyone here has had any experience. I haven't. Um, but these patients had spinal cord stimulators and didn't work, so they put wires in their brain, uh, and it did to varying degrees. Um, and this appears to have been a maintained benefit. It's always bad when DBS fails. It's not the end of the world, but um, and it is a relatively safe procedure. It's just that you've gone through all that and the hopes and dreams, and then it doesn't work. But it usually works more often than not, although I've not done it for this yet. So this is pretty convincing. The scale's changed, but you know, so that might not impress you. But then if you, I tried to sort of scale it, so there's a lot less tremor. Um, so they're disrupting the tremor network. And these, look at this guy, loving it. So he went from 30 seconds of standing time to f so more than five minutes. Um, couldn't even look at a bottle of drugs without feeling sick. So, you know, couldn't, untreatable basically with drugs. Although my favorite drug lyric is not there. Um, and this lady on a cocktail, you know, side effects and minimal benefit, um, she got off drugs. And this is not an astounding numerical change, but um, from all reports, Neil said she's very happy. Um, and if you turn it off, the other, the other way to test whether DBS is working is, you know, someone comes back at year three, four, five, and they um, say, I'm not sure if it's working, you just turn it off. Um, that's pretty convincing. And then you reprogram. Mm. There's lots of little tricks you can do there. Because uh, uh, it is a pot is a progressive disease, gradually progressive. So um, like with any progressive disease and DBS, you'd need proper programming. Can't just leave it. So you're not supposed to read all this, but this is, you know, 37, someone young like Nick, um, to age 73. I've got to say I have you know, 50, 60 is the usual age of onset. 
I saw you sick of hearing that, but it's true. Um, do you know anyone else that's as young as you? Well, when someone joined the group that was actually in her teens, I was not convinced it was OT and um, because she had lots of other symptoms of other varying things mm. and I don't think it's any longer on the page so therefore is, um, I think, diagnosed with something else. Okay. So some of these patients with the same brain target had transient slash incomplete improvement um, and other patients did really well. Um, so, you know, in a world of 7 billion people, this is 17 patients. Make of it what you will. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we should rule it out. Um, and strangely, like I said, they don't do good stuff, like, you know, like at least do balanced scores so we can make some, some judgment ourselves on whether we should offer this to patients, um, you know, but then there's that uh, annoying Victor Fung paper that says it doesn't matter if you sway more, but I think it does, because uh, I've stood there a lot watching people wobble around the fourth platform, mm. so I don't understand that study. Um, Botox, there's a guy in Melbourne, Dave Williams, that tried Botox. Again, this is blaming those little muscle spindle things, because mm. if you um, inject muscles with Botox, you silence the spindles. It's true. Um, they shut up along with all the contractile, you know, the um, moving your legs muscles. But that didn't work either. I did it once and it made this lady feel a bit weak. So that's really not really gone anywhere. Good theory though, but still, we've tested it. So yeah, this... Yeah, but she looked beautiful. Has <laughs> 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 Peter done your Botox? <laughs> I'd love to. For your eye trimming. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what we tell I'm them. not winking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on. Patients had diminished effect, but, you know, I would reprogram them. That, that sounds nice. So that sounds like um, very similar to what you do for essential tremor. Mm. Uh, you don't cure anyone. Um, so uh, I think I'm heading towards the end. You all hang in there, and then we'll have a break. Um, it's my favourite thing to do. I spend half my life doing it, mm. deep brain stimulation. The other half of my life is just movement disorders and migraine, strangely. Um, sounds scary, but um, it's been done for 25 years. It's a pretty slick operation. There's a neurosurgeon and a um, neurologist and a bunch of people uh, with all sorts of gadgets we can record. So, you know, record from the area of the brain that we're targeting and you hear the neurons firing and the same time as that tremor that you'll hear. Um, problem with OT is you can't get someone up and walk. But you know, you could do, f I've never done it, but you could do fun stuff like get someone to push. Because patients are quite calm. So we'll do the first bit, this bit with the, uh, this thing is a frame, the base of the stereoductive frame. These pins aren't very friendly, so you, do, you, you need to get them the plastic uh, screws that get screwed into the skull, uh, and if they move, then everything's you know mm -hmm. out of whack. So you've got to have them screwed in, and so the uh, patients are asleep. And then we do a um, intra-op CT scan. That's this thing moving back and forth down the left, um, and then fancy software down the right. So we you can pretty much get an electro within one millimeter of the target. It's amazing, um, thanks to all this tech. And then. Although, I, I, so we, you can see the target directly. In the olden days, I used to do like this uh, GPS-based system, you know, three paces to the left, five down, um, coordinates based off indirect targeting, but thanks to MRI now, you know exactly where you're putting the probe. Um, the top right is the uh, electrode recordings. So you could have a calm patient because you wake them up halfway through if they have tremor. Um, you know, not always. Last week we did a, a sleep case because the patient's symptoms weren't accessible on the table. But with an OT patient, you could push on their leg or arm and see whether the tremor went away when you were stimulating um, or have an EMG machine on. That's what I'd do. Uh, it takes a couple of hours to two or three hours to implant the, to target the electrodes and then um, they're connected up to a, a pacemaker type thing. It's all implanted and then you program it with a like a tablet-based device. Um, 
And because I've never done any orthostatic tremor patients, I'll just put up... Um, I think we have a freeze. Um, yeah, so did you add on? I take Lyrica in, in the morning. We have when you added on the new one? No, we have the Lyrica she was on and just yeah. added. And what symptoms? At night that? time. Um, walking. I can walk better. Yeah. Added on Parampanel to Lyrica, you have an, a combination of gait freezing and a tremor. Oh. Apparently. Yes, yes I do. Not yes, just sir. not primary, yes, or th so just be aware, it's not, it's not just I pot. It's no. And gait you found. Freezing. It's gait freezing. What's better with, with Parampanel? Um, um, what's the word? More, re more relaxed. Speed? Yes, better. And I, um, I feel, feel, feel that it gives me, gives me confidence to walk. Yes. And yes, and um, what about standing still and yes, standing to people. Yes, that's yeah. okay. And what about side effects? None, so far. What's that? Two. Two million. Two million. Yeah, it's like lady in. So how long? Uh, how long have we been on it? Uh, three months. Th three months, not very long. So oh, don't know. We can have one. that uh, lyric ourselves, and then we tell Peter Silburn. So if you can get rid of one drug, which is arguably not helping, then that's even more evidence that it's useful. Uh, thanks. All right, who else? Who else? Dose? Um, I was on two milligrams for almost six months. And you add. Um, sorry. Uh, and you added it on to something? No, no one is. Uh, I was taking CBD oil illegally, but I stopped that. <laughs> was that any good? We were talking about this before. It, it, would, it should at least help the calming aspect. Yeah. I don't know. What did you think? Did it just? Um, is there a mellowing effect? I think so. Yes. Was that with or without THC? No, Okay, that sounds promising. Um, anyone else? Has anyone else where it's done nothing? Yes? Oh. Was it a dose thing? Did you try going up?
Yeah, all the anti-epileptics can cause mood changes because they damp down things that you don't want to. So I've not heard of that as a um, OT drug. Is anyone else? Babe, tell your story. That sounds I good. I take two milligrams to try Crumper, and I'm getting good results from he it. He walks beautifully. She yeah. wears heels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very smart. I've been never wear them for years, and I don't feel like I'm going to fall down the stairs. When I walk down, I have complete balance going down the stairs, whereas before I used to want to fall over, I had to hold the railing, and I couldn't go down without holding the railing. Now I can. Were you getting side effects from the other ones? No, I wasn't getting any, but I put on weight with it. And since I've been on um, Pride Cropper, I've lost... Delicious. Yeah, Lyrica causes weight gain in some people. Yeah. Lyrica is renowned for causing... Lyrica. Or gabapentin, whichever one. And gabapentin. Hmm. And I put on weight with that, whereas I've lost it now. I've lost nearly six kilos. The only side effect I may have, I'm going to a throat for specialist on... Sounds good. I got the videos working. My neurologist, he's got me a test case. I see him every three months. He teaches the fetcher. And, well, every three months he's checking me out. Because I've had the EMG done pre and a post, which I've got here. And you can see the big results from it. So I'm completely happy with it. Because it was... See? Sue was thinking about it. Okay, um, I'm just going to wrap up with some videos. Uh, I've got two, more, two or three more slides. Um, this is the kind of response you see before and after um, stimulators for a hand tremor. But unfortunately, you can't seem to m promise that in a leg tremor. Um, but um, probably because it's a different disease. Uh, fast forward, no, that one. This is a fun one. This is a guy that um, he's got a snooker setting. So this is his best snooker setting, um, and it causes a little bit of slurred speech. But he just switches to snooker setting on snooker night, um, and this is him, you know, without it on. So he can't even pour. Um, I don't know if I got. So that's without, uh, yeah, I mean, he can, so I got him to bring, bring in his pool cue. Did I show the before? Yeah, so that's his um, pool cue tremor, amongst other things. Uh, sorry? Who? No, no, no this, uh, this is what we want for patients with OT and DBS, but you can't. That doesn't seem to be something you can promise. Um, so DBS, uh, just to finish off on that, uh, the surgical risk is it's about the same as having hip replacement. That's what this says here. This is a marketing slide from the stimulator companies because they want people to, you know, have stimulators or implants. Um, but it's good. It's a good slide because I never, if you put it that way, would you have a hip operation? Would you have a hip replacement? And then I immediately rang up my orthopedic surgeon mate. And I went what is your mortality rate overall from anaesthetic and frailty and clots? And it is about 0.3.4%, which then scared me about hips. So, <laughs> um, okay, so wrapping up, so we can have some coffee. Um, the new research, there's more descriptions of describing this abnormal network that we knew was already there. Um, maybe this will inform uh, the invasive treatments like which brain target. Um, spoke to my friend, he's done three different brain targets and the one that I use for essential tremor seems to be the most effective, so that's what I'd do. 
Um, it's called the posterior subthalamic area or zona inserta, and that was that patient that got went from 30 seconds to five minutes. That was yeah. the zona inserta implant. Um, anyway, that's the hardcore invasive, but you know I, I, I do it all, all the time, so I don't think of it as that that scary. But patients need to be um, in, properly informed before they go down that path. Yeah. Uh, the bottom-up approach, I like that. I really like I want someone to come up with a, a portable tendon vibrator. That's, uh, you know, not that visible uh, that you can wear and people don't go, what the hell is that? That'd be nice. Maybe in a boot, just be this kind of boot thing. Um, and then this drug, there should be more in the literature. I'd be happy to do a study with the, um, the problem is if people have to agree to come up with their drug. So I actually did another study, a placebo sort of study on the Lyrica, Lyrica patients, about eight patients, and they got withdrawal symptoms when they came off it, which I didn't predict, you know, vomiting and diarrhea and stuff. So you can't really blind it. Um, and then they just didn't want to go off it again. So. Uh, so my suggestions were, as always, just find the cause and cure it. Um, but we don't know the cause, so that's hard. Uh, but we could discover more specific treatment we found the cause, it's probable, um, or we just come up with new ways of measuring it, like the, the Munich people, you know, wearable technology, and there's an app on your phone that can measure your tremor frequency, all that sort of stuff, um, and we'll keep trying these repurposed drugs, because uh, I think it is a syndromic thing, and then some drugs will work better than others for different people, as just evidenced by the um, straw poll and parampanel, ficompa, uh, and then just keep going with the non-drug stuff. That's what I do with Parkinson's, which is a definite neurodegenerative disease where we have no cure. You just add in other non-drug treatments until you, uh, you know, maximize quality of life. So that's where I'll end. <laughs>